today as we come to the table. What's interesting about sanctification is there's two different words used in scripture for sanctification. One word means a gradual but continual process where God changes us day by day and makes us more and more like Jesus for his use and his glory. And that is happening as we're going through the word of God together. You're being sanctified. Why? Not because of me, God's word. As you're hearing these verses, God's word has power and it goes in and it's changing you day by day, washing you, making you more like the Lord. That's one definition of the way sanctification is used in scripture. What does it mean to be sanctified? The process of sanctification comes when you continue to faithfully follow the Lord's will in your life. Once you surrender your life to Jesus, He put His Holy Spirit within you to do His will. The more you walk with Jesus and abide with Him, day by day He transforms you. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table. The Daily Bible Study Program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Pastor Mark explains in today's message that every day as a follower of Jesus, the Lord is working to transform you more into His likeness. This is what sanctification is, to gradually become more like Christ. The goal is to each day ask yourself how you can shine more like Jesus and to serve His kingdom and will for your life. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the first book of Thessalonians chapter 4 with today's edition of Come to the Table. What is our culture like today? If you tell someone that you're a virgin or want to remain a virgin until married, they're going to look at you like, weirdo, you know, homeschool. <laughs> no, righteous, godly, holy. Now, if you're saying, Mark, it's too late. Well, I understand that. Aren't you glad for the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of our God? Amen. He heals, he restores, he renews. And that's why we rejoice. Look, we're not here because we were all righteous. We were, pretty, we were sinners and God used it to bring us here. Some of us did worse than others. Some of us were involved in different things you know, that, that other people weren't, but the bottom line is we're all guilty before God. And the sexual issue is a huge thing. And maybe some of you this morning, maybe there's some things here as we get into this, they're gonna go, oh no, that makes me feel uncomfortable. But you know what? God wants to deal with you. Because if you're going to walk at a higher standard in holiness with God, you've got to learn how to walk in holiness with God with your body. That's a part of it. And sadly, much of the church thinks that, well, you know what? You don't even have to worry about that aspect, that aspect of it. No big deal. I'm saved. I'm in the kingdom. No, God wants you to be holy in every way. And look, it's not just so that your relationship with God is closer because that grieves God's spirit, but God would spare you the consequences. Listen, I can tell you living a life of sin brings great consequences. And I shared just a little bit about, you know, my past and what happened. I talked about being back in Nashville a minute ago. Because of things that I did in my past, I had 10 years. I couldn't get insurance for my, and then I got married. I've got a family. I can't get insurance because of my past sinless. That's one of many. The point is, there are consequences. Even when we're forgiven of our sin, there are consequences of that sin. And those consequences, God said, I would spare you. I want to spare you the consequence. So stay pure, go to a different standard. And to the Thessalonians and to us, he would say, you know what, if you've you've not gone there, don't go there. If you have gone there, know the grace and mercy and forgiveness of the Lord, but make a choice today. I'm gonna walk with God the way he says I should walk. The world can do what it's gonna do. We expect that, but the believers have a higher standard. Let's get into it. Notice in verse one, he says, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Now, I love this. Paul, again, starts off exhorting them not only to keep on the path of growth that they were on. Remember, he was there three weeks. He planted a church. He had to leave. They have no Bibles. They can get an Old Testament now because they know they need to have one, right? 
He's writing the Bible currently by writing him this letter. I don't know. He probably didn't know that. And they probably certainly didn't know that as God was anointing him and using him to write it. But they're there as baby Christians with no pastor. And Paul says, listen, you need to continue on this path of growth. Don't fall away. But not only on the path of growth, I love this. He says, you need to abound more and more. You know, I talked about how I love this new pavement because if you're a skateboarder, it's like the best. <laughs> Remember those Super Bowls when you were a kid? This room would be fantastic. And don't try it because you probably get little things all over the wall and you hit the screens and all. But you could throw those things down. They were, like, they were super abounding. Remember those? I do as a kid. You, bottom line is, that's what this word means. He says, I want you to be growing, but I want you to be like, whoa. Now, that doesn't mean everywhere, you know, like out of control and not, you know, no, no steady path here. Doesn't mean that, but it means just people say, whoa, he's growing. She's really taking off for the Lord. Okay, that's what it means. I want you to abound more and more. And it's a great encouragement for us as well, because we not only need to pursue the Lord and continue the growth that we're in, but we always need to be focused on pleasing the Lord and growing more and more. We should never be satisfied in where we are in the Lord. Let me ask you this. When you're sitting there right now, are you satisfied? Are you satisfied? You say, yeah, this is enough. I'll just show up on Sunday and then I'll live the week the way that I want. And then I'll show back up next Sunday, then live another week the way I want and show back next Sunday and we're good. Listen, can you be saved and do that? Absolutely. Here's all, here's all it takes to be saved. The Bible says if you believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he's Lord and you look to the cross, you will be saved. There's no, you don't have to do works. It's not how many times you go to church. It's not how often. And that's, that does, that's not the point. But if the attitude and the heart is, I'm good. I don't need to seek God anymore. Just relax. This is enough. Your attitude's wrong. And what Paul was saying to the Thessalonians and what he's saying to us is, you need to not be satisfied. You need to say, you know what? You see that guy and that gal that's really bouncing higher for the Lord? Go for it. Go for it. What are you waiting on? You need to be growing all the time. And I hope we're not satisfied. We always need to be pursuing growth in the Lord and getting farther in the things of God. You know, there's a danger. The older you get in the Lord and now being in the Lord not that long compared to maybe some others, I don't know, but over 30 years now for me, there's a danger sometimes to kind of as an older believer to kind of get comfortable and satisfied. I've got my routine. Here's what I do each week, and I'm doing this whatever. You know, God will come along every so often. He'll kind of he'll rattle our cage. He'll kind of shake it up and go, yeah, you like that, huh? How about this? Oh, you know, I'm not saying, he didn't scare us. I'm painting a wrong picture of God. Pastor said he scares us. He didn't scare you. But he will rattle your cage. And what I mean by that is, what are you doing, Mark? What are you doing? Look, God gives us leisure time. God gives us vacation. God gives us fun. The Bible says God has given us all things richly to enjoy. You know, a day on the lake, riding the motorcycle, whatever. Enjoy. But that shouldn't be where our focus is in life. Those are the fun things we add to our focus on Jesus. The problem is for many believers, that becomes the focus of their life. And they kind of squeeze Jesus in with a, hey, Lord, I'm going down the lake today. There's one extra seat. You want to come? Maybe we'll pray before we get out. Lord, bless our day today. Okay, here we go. You know, whatever. He's not saying it's wrong to enjoy. He's saying, don't include him. He should be your main focus. And the other things are what you add in there. And so we need to be always seeking the Lord. And we're not going to really be where we need to be until we are fully with the Lord. I hope, look, I hope that my heart and that God keeps me in a place where I'm constantly growing in the Lord till the day I die. I don't want to be satisfied. You know, e even now, I've already gone through 1 Thessalonians. Many years ago, we went through 1 Thessalonians. I think at the other building. I've got all those notes. You know what be easy to do? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, First Thessalonians, open up your Bible. I'm going to be on the lake all week, and Sunday morning I've got my notes, and here we go. No, I restudy it because God has shown me over the years new things, and God will give me new insight, and God will speak to me again, and there's a whole separate set of notes. Why? Because I know that the way I used to be, it isn't enough. I hope that I can serve you guys until the day that I die. Now, I don't know. I think the Lord will come back before that, quite honestly. I don't think I have a chance for that. Of course, you never know. We, we could go at any moment. But I hope that I'm able to serve you guys until the day that I die. And I don't want it to be where a thing where I'm so old that it becomes just, you know, tell him to stay home. You know, it's getting ridiculous now. You're watching me shuffle up here and it takes 10 minutes to get the pulpit, you know, and, and I can barely read. I'm leaning down. You know, <laughs> Finally, you know, whatever. Right? But I'll tell you this. Even if I get to where I can't physically serve the Lord anymore and, and it becomes unfair to you, for me to be up here and we need someone younger and we I get that. I can't just I can't just go on lifelong vacation from that point on. I can't do it. I mean, yes, I understand retirement. 
that doesn't mean that we quit serving the Lord. Jesus said this, I must be about my father's business. You know, they go away and they're looking for Jesus. Remember, he wasn't with them because it was a huge entourage at one of the feasts and they would travel in large numbers. I mean, it could have been over 60 people in that one entourage with that family. They find out for a couple of days, where's Jesus? He's not here. They go back and Mary's frantic as any mom would be. Where were you? Didn't you know we were worried? What are you doing? And he looks at her shocked and goes, didn't you know I, I had to be about my father's business? Why was it? In other words, why wasn't this the first place you looked, mom? Would God say that about us? Is the first place God will look for us is serving him? You know, I was looking at my notes this morning, and before I come out, all the times I'll check the news real quick to make sure that things aren't blowing up around the world that I need to let you guys know about. And this article pops up, hey, you know, five different countries that are bringing in those who want the tropical life to live out their years. I'm thinking, whoa, what's that about, you know? I think, well, you know, if everything collapsed and America goes under, then, hmm, maybe I go and just live on the beach somewhere, you know, in a little cup with a little umbrella in it, whatever type thing. That pops in your brain for a second, and then you go, wait a minute. First of all, I don't think that's going to happen. Secondly, Mark, could you really be satisfied? It may may sound appealing to think, wow, no responsibility, sitting on the beach. There's going to come a point where God's going to say, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You must be about the Father's business. I could never do it. So even if this didn't work out, I would have to find something I could do to serve the Lord. God wants that for all of us. He says, be abounding in the things of God. Don't be satisfied. Be pressing forward. And he says there in verse 3, notice what he says. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Note that. Notice Paul starts verse 3 telling us the will of God for our life. How many people have I heard say, I wish I knew the will of God for my life? Maybe some of you this morning are saying right now, I wish I knew the will of God for my life. Well, I don't know what your total will of God is for your life in every place, but if you want to have an overall snapshot, this is it. Your sanctification. That is God's will for your life. Okay, Mark, now you're using these theology words. I don't know what that means. Well, don't worry. I didn't either until I looked it up. We all have to learn what these words mean, right? What's interesting about sanctification is there's two different words used in Scripture for sanctification. One word means a gradual but continual process where God changes us day by day and makes us more and more like Jesus for his use and his glory. And that is happening as we're going through the word of God together. You're being sanctified. Why? Not because of me, God's word. As you're hearing these verses, God's word has power and it goes in and it's changing you day by day, washing you, making you more like the Lord. That's one definition of the way sanctification is used in scripture. But there's a second definition of the way that sanctification is used and that is the word that's used here. And it means this. The second definition is an instantaneous change in the spirit where God immediately sets us apart for his service and his glory. It means to be set apart solely and completely for God's use and God's purposes. So what Paul was saying to the Thessalonians and to us is that God's will for our lives is that we be set apart solely and completely for God's use alone. Let me give you a practical example. This is how serious God sees your service and how he set you aside. What he did was he said, look, I'm going to change you day by day, right? But I'm going to grab you and I'm setting you over here. You're mine. The world can do what it's going to do, and you're going to interact with it because you're going to serve me. But I'm going to put you over here. You're only to be used for my purposes. You can have lots of fun. You can play. I've given you all things richly to enjoy. There's a big playground. Just stay away from sin, but you're going to be used for my purposes. A practical picture of this is that's exactly what they would do with all the implements in the temple. And let me explain. Those of you that are going to Israel with us here in October, if indeed that happens, and so far the door's still open, and those of you that have been with us in the past, we go to the Temple Institute, and they show us behind glass all the implements for the priest to use in the temple when they build the third temple. And you get to see the shovel for the ashes at the altar. You get to see the fork that's used to move the sacrificial animals. You get to see the incense and the incense holder when they offer it up to the Lord. And the prayers go up before the priest in the holy place and all this. And all these things have been made and set apart specifically for the temple. Now, here's the deal. If you were to say to one of those rabbis back in Jesus' day or even today, hey, you know what? I want to plant some flowers out front. Can I grab that that, uh, that temple shovel? Could you hand me that? I'm going to dig some flowers. Whoa. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you can't use any of the special implements that have been set aside for God's service in the world service. You can't do that. You can't go and use that shovel to dig a regular hole. This has been set apart for God. And this is only to be used in the service of God for God's glory. That is what this word means, you are. 
That doesn't mean you can't be involved in whatever it be, politics or, or working in your office. No, everywhere we are, we are a vessel used of God. It doesn't mean you're, you're not set apart for God. It doesn't mean everybody has to work in the church. What it means is wherever God puts you, you're sanctified. You've been set apart for his glory, for his purpose, and for his use. And any other use is unacceptable to him. Powerful. And so, again, that's what the word means here. And so, again, we need to understand that's who we are, and that's who we walk with the Lord in being that and in using that for the Lord. That's why I say even if I was to get to a place where I couldn't be a pastor anymore, there would be something that I would have to do to make sure that I was serving the Lord. And then we have to realize in what Paul's about to go into when it comes to the sexual things of life, which we'll just get started into, get more into next week, that is our bodies have been set apart for the Lord as well. How are we using our bodies for God's glory? Notice again what Paul says here. He goes on and says, for the, that we should abstain from sexual immorality, that each should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Again, Paul notice says here that as an instrument set apart for God, we have to abstain from sexual immorality. Now the problem comes in, what is the biblical definition of sexual immorality? Because everybody has a definition of sexual morality or immorality, don't they? Again, this is why the Bible is so important. If mankind is left to his own devices to decide what sexual immorality is, you're going to have a wide-ranging definition. But the believer, we have to go to the Word of God and say, here's what God's Word says about it. This is what God's definition is. And there's a biblical definition, which again, the world's not going to understand, but we have to because God has called us to a higher standard. And God is the creator, and God is the one who is alone holy. He is the one who tells us what is right and wrong, what is righteous and what is unrighteous. So his biblical definition is the only one that we can apply to our lives. You can't go by what the world's doing. The world not may say it's okay. The world will say whatever it is, fill in the blank, it's okay. That's the world's definition. But we as believers have a higher call. And so the Bible declares that, now first of all, we need to understand, the Bible declares that any form of sexual activity, because we're going to get into the definition here, any form of sexual activity apart from a man and a woman is sin. And I'm going to take it farther than that. The Bible teaches that any sexual activity outside of marriage is sin as well. And so we have to understand that. Now, again, there's, this definition needs a further delving into because there's a lot of confusion out there about even what male and female is anymore and what the biblical definition is. We have to understand that. Again, this is why we have our children as a you know, fifth grade and under in the kids' area, and we have us in here because we talk as adults, right? We get down to brass tacks. We're going to do that some this morning. You say, well, we can't, you know, people can decide whether, you know, in our day and age, they say people can decide whether they're a man or a woman. But the world may do that. I get that. And we're to love them wherever they are and to, to reach them for Christ. But God says very clearly, no, a male and a female, that's the only thing I approve of when it comes to physical relations. And now we know biologically and genetically that you can very clearly see genetically and biologically whether someone's a male or a female. And God says any relations outside of that, he says is sinful. It doesn't matter whether we have a different attitude or surgery or take hormones. The bottom line is, he says, it is between a male and a female the way that I created them biologically and genetically. And that's the first thing that's laid out as far as God's definition of proper physical relations. But, but notice also, I said, and I want to emphasize this for a moment, any sexual activity that is outside of that marriage relation or outside of a, of a but by the way, the second one is marriage. Before I even get to this other one, it's not just male and female. God says you need to be married. So it has to be male and female, and they have to be married, or the sexual relations are not proper before God. That's the standard for the believer. Now, as I said, I mentioned earlier, any sexual activity outside of that, the reason I say this, and I see this as a pastor, and I've seen it more than once, and you need to be aware of it. Don't justify any sexual activity just because you're not having physical intercourse and say, that well, we didn't really sleep together, so we didn't really do anything wrong. Note this. The Bible says the standard. Now, the world's not going to understand this. But within the church, the Bible says the standard for the believer is no sexual activity of any kind, not physical intercourse or anything else. All of it is sin before God. And we're called to a higher standard. Now, again, this is where the grace of God comes in. Because some of you might be saying, well, I've already blown that. I've messed that up. I'm already in trouble there. No, this is where his mercy comes in. What do we do? We ask forgiveness. God, forgive me. And from this point on, I'm going to choose to walk according to your standard, not the standard of the world. 
And so notice, next he says, we should know how to possess our own vessel. Look at there, verse 4, that each should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor. That is set apart for God, for his use alone, and for honor. And again, this goes hand in hand with sexual purity because there's no way we can grow in the Lord, especially honor him, if we're living in sexual immorality. And notice he says, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who don't know God. Again, the world doesn't know God. They don't have this standard. That's why we don't scream at them about what they're doing. We simply, here's what the Word of God says. We live it. Here's why. And we try to lead them to the cross. As they go to the cross, God takes everything else and deals with it. You know, as one pastor used to say, and you've probably heard me say numerous times, God cleans his fish after he catches them, right? Draw them into the Lord. Let them know of his love. And then God begins to clean things up. But not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God, even as we just noted, because they're driven by fleshly lust and not driven by the Holy Spirit. God says, look, as believers, you can't be driven by your sex drive. You've got to be driven by the Spirit of God. Let him control the appetites in this area. The next thing is that Paul warns them. He says, make sure that you don't defraud our brother or sister in this. We're going to stop at this point. As far as we're going to go with this today, because we're going to jump back in and spend more detail on this next week. But let me just say this. This gets into a very interesting thing because the word defraud here means to take something that's not yours. Guys, gals, if you're being physically active before marriage, here's what God says. I love you. This is wrong. And you're taking something that is not yet yours to take. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to their husband, and it belongs to their wife. And he says, the world's going to do what they're going to do, but within the church, don't defraud each other in this matter. Now, next week, we're going to get into some heavy issues pertaining to this, because when you really think this through, and you think it even theologically, if you believe that God has chosen your wife or your husband, even before the foundation of the world, and that's what the Bible says, the Bible says before the earth was even created, God ordained, foreordained, how many of our days? All of them. Does that include your husband, wife, and your wedding day? Okay, I'm, I'm going to end with something heavy, and then I'm going to pray for us. That means that God knows who your wife's going to be before you even meet them. And if you're physically active with anybody before that, wow, I'll leave that up to you to work through in your mind what that means. Because God says, I've got someone I've chosen for you. They're the ones that physical activity is supposed to happen with after you're married. Anyone else, they've not been allowed to do that. So heavy stuff today, heavy stuff. But the bottom line is, is that God wants us, and I'll end it with this. God wants us to be pure. We need to be pure unto the Lord in how we live our life. The good news is this. If you've not been pure, like many of us in this room, you have hope. Because the Bible says that the blood of Jesus washes every sin away. The blood of Jesus cleanses. The blood of Jesus renews. And regardless of how bad we've messed up our past, God will renew it and he'll use us from this point forward if we'll simply repent and ask him to do it. And I want to end by praying and saying, if you don't know the Lord, I want to give you an opportunity to meet him right now. But if you do know the Lord and you say, God, this is me, I'm guilty before you. Listen, don't leave this place with the guilt on your shoulders. Be free. Confess it, walk out of here dancing and rejoicing because your sins were paid for on the cross 2,000 years ago. You don't have to carry the guilt. He paid for it on the cross. You've been listening to Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. Pastor Mark has been teaching through the book of 1 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul was arguably one of the greatest Christian missionaries and wrote most of the books of the New Testament. Yet Paul tells the Thessalonians that everything is done by God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't try to convince the Thessalonians with flattery or fancy language. He merely preached the gospel to them. And it was the Holy Spirit who opened their hearts to accept God's Word and transform their lives. Which areas of your life do you need the power of the Holy Spirit to work in today? We'd be happy to speak with you or even connect with you on our website. You can call us at 865-609-1385. Again, that phone number is 865-609-1385. You can also visit our website, thewaymedia.net, and search for our questions and comments link to connect with us. Want to hear this message again? you can easily download the Way Media app. Come to the Table is a ministry based out of Calvary, Knoxville, and we hope you've been blessed by this time today in the book of 1 Thessalonians. If you're ever in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, would you come join us on a Sunday morning? 
TheWayMedia.net has all the information you need to know about service times and location. We look forward to meeting you. Please join us again next time as Pastor Mark has more to share from the book of 1 Thessalonians here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.